taking a little library work and a little thanks to uh, the Google. But when I was back at my hometown for a high school reunion, I decided to see where some of my relatives were interred. Thanking to the uh, Google Maps, I found this little country cemetery out in the middle of nowhere. It was way out of town in the county. You had to drive up a state road and then onto a small, modest county road to find this plot populated with markers. I perused the area until I found myself before a very large headstone and read the foot marker, now partially obscured with overgrown grass. Name John Epley Champion, born 1868 and died in 1929. As expected to his left was his wife, Laura, who made it to 1951. So I stood in the sunshine of a warm Saturday afternoon and I wondered about the lives of these two really deeply rooted rural folks, my great grandparents. A bonus came for me in finding Laura's parents, Reuben and Margaret Bridges, both born in the 1840s in that very same graveyard. No more than five feet from Laura's footstone was an obelisk for their grave markers. So within a couple of strides, I could find my great-great-grandparents who had seen the American Civil War. Now both the Champions and the Bridges were farm folks. I would have expected, as was the custom of their day, to find all of these people interred in a small family plot on the crest of a pasture land. Indeed, on my drive, I had passed virtually dozens of these statements to a rural past. You know, those small plots bordered by a collapsing wrought iron fence. Farm folks had often set up a family plot where the people who had tilled the land and worked it and loved it had decided to be buried on those very fields. But that was not the case for Laura and Reuben or Margaret or John. They were in a cemetery that had held literally hundreds of people and just by looking at the names, it was very clear these were not all blood relatives. This cemetery was no family affair. They had chosen to be interred in a communally set, right, setting of a cemetery and I thought, why here? For souls so firmly, deeply rooted in the land whose obituaries had made it clear that they were multi-generation farm families, why break with that long-standing custom and desire your eternal rest not on the familiar, furrowed fields that you had walked, but among a horde of unrelated people and along a country road? Well, that answer really was easy. All you had to do was turn 90 degrees to your left and there was the simple two-towered edifice brick of the Union Baptist Church. And it was in their graveyard that I stood. You see, these folks had decided to be buried among their family of faith rather than among their family of biology. Now I'm not telling you all this to brag on my genealogical, uh, de my investigatory progress uh, or to bore you with my genealogy. Many of you can do it far better than I have done. You can go into great detail about your families. I tell you this story to underscore something that you may find in your own family about the power of God's Holy Spirit residing in a community of everyday saints. You see, standing before Laura and Ep Champion, something clicked in my mind. I remember hearing my grandfather sort of offhandedly say how he had come from a large farm family, 12 children, of which 10 survived into adulthood. And there, as I stood before my great-grandparents, there were two smaller recessed markers, a few feet, and they had the names of children. One who had lived only a few months, another who had made it almost a year. Now, having been a minister to those who have lost a child, I had seen the anguish and the emptiness amid that loss. Those who bury a child carry a unique grief, often inflamed by the loss, not only of death, but the loss of dreams and potential, of what might have been. It hit me why those bridges and champions had abandoned the old tradition of the farm funeral. 
They wanted to be buried among the Christian family that had loved them as Jesus had loved and brought his care through all the joy and pain in their life's journey. For most of us, there is a small cadre of folks who influenced our lives. Some of us taught us our colors or how to do math, but others shaped our faith. Perhaps it was a parent or an aunt or a Sunday school teacher, some caring adult whose faith led us to understand they loved us because Jesus loved them. And every time we think of those people, there are vivid memories, almost as vivid as the rich smell of a honeysuckle on a warm spring night. These people lived Jesus, and because of them we believe. Their imprint is so deep, if you were to tell me about them, almost every story would start with, I'll never forget when. Oh, it's not new. Christians who leave their mark on others have been around since the founding of Christ's church. Faith in Christ grew because there were those individuals who so clearly lived the Jesus way. Their influence molded and influenced how others understood and encountered God. 2,000 years ago, Folks would say of their spiritual mentors, I will never forget when. And because they were so important to the life of their church, much like we honor our presidents or our veterans annually, yet early Christians would declare a day, a day to honor and retell the story of faithful Christians. Those exceptional persons were identified as saints. You have a, a St. Patrick's Day or a St. Valentine's Day. But the church, soon had a problem. There are only 365 days. What do you do about those tens of thousands, perhaps even millions of Christians who have impacted individual lives in the name of Christ? The solution came in the ninth century when the church formally declared November the 1st would be a day to remember all saints. So today, here we are at All Saints Day. It's a time to stop and to reflect on all those who handed down the love of God revealed in Jesus to us. If you went to a Catholic church today, you'd hear about those folks that Baptists wouldn't recognize, a Polycarp, a Columba, a Julian of Norwich. Baptists don't tend to follow a liturgical calendar, but we still do the same things, don't we? I mean, congregations inscribe names on stained glass windows, or they put them on the insides of hymn books. But we also note, note faithful folks pass from the scene, having done all that day-to-day -day spirituality. Those folks who set up the coffee every Sunday morning, that rocked children in the nursery, that visited hospitals, or built a wheelchair ramp, or took a casserole to a grieving family. They may not have been showy or congregational rock stars, but they lived the faith in the day-to-day. They are our saints because their fingerprints are all over us. And because of these type of everyday saints, we sense First Baptist is a different and better place because they lived among us. It's why you see the candles on the communion table today. It's our way to remember the significance of a life of faith that touched ours. And so we honor our, all those saints that we lost last year. But amid a traditional All Saints uh, recognition, I want to push you to think about why you are here. Why are you not on a golf course or sleeping in or checking your email right now? What is it about church today that draws you to be here in hopes of finding the presence of God? Is it not because the texture of our lives have been shaped by the saints of our past? Are there not those who shared with you the grace and mercy of Jesus? Did they not show you a God of compassion and forgiveness? Did they not help you be who you are as a person of faith? Let me suggest to you that we are here because somewhere in your life, in some way, there were people who lived Jesus. Whether it was in first century Jerusalem, or 1847 Austin, or just a few days ago, there are people who found themselves enmeshed in the Holy Spirit and lived out what Paul told those Romans was critical to being church. Love must be sincere, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, 
Honor one another over yourselves. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And as far as possible, as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Ask yourself, if you knew people with these qualities, would they not share God in everything they do? And would you not want to hang out with those folks? Sincere, loving, patient, prayerful, joyful. I mean, these are great folks, Jesus people. And we actually get to sense God's Holy Spirit living in them. And is that not what church is? Folks will flock to be here if we're like that. You see, the great saints of the church are not those who wrote great theological volumes or marched in an army off to the Crusades. The people who made the church the body of Christ are those who live out the love of God seen in Jesus. Or as John described it, this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our sisters and brothers. Let me make this personal. I think I know why Epp and Laura and Reuben and Margaret chose to be buried at Union Baptist Church. It was because they found saints who lived that love of God. And when they went to church, they found people who were devoted to God and to each other. They wanted to be buried not on their land, but among these souls who had, who had been there to celebrate when Reuben and Margaret joined that church. They celebrated when Epp and Laura got married in that sanctuary. And those same souls would come to visit them and cry and hug them tightly when they poured out the sorrow of their tears about their babies who had died. They ended up saying, you bury me here because I want to be with these saints at Union Baptist. They were authentic and real and honest and open and they let the Holy Spirit guide them. Simply when they died, they wanted to be with God's people more than on their land. And I believe it's because they found church folks like the ones described in Romans and 1 John. Sam Rayburn grew up in Texas. He was baptized in a Baptist church and got involved in local politics. You may recognize the name because he ultimately got elected to Congress and represented his district for 31 years. But his claim to fame was be, he became Speaker of the House of Representatives longer than any one person, 17 years. He worked in D.C. for three decades. Rayburn knew all the persons of power. His social network was there in Washington. But suddenly, at the very peak of his power, Rayburn was diagnosed with advanced cancer. And he immediately announced to everyone that he was going to resign his seat and return to his little hometown in the backwaters of Texas called Bonham. His political friends were passionate in trying to dissuade him. As a congressman, stay here in D.C. You'll get the finest of medical care. And besides, you won't have to resign your seat of power. You can still continue to influence things going on. Rayburn absolutely was adamant. In Bonham, he replied, people know when you're sick and they care when you die. Now ask yourself, isn't that what church should be? And isn't it with such folks you would want to be in the significant moments of your own life? Thanks be to God for the thankful people who across the centuries had opened their hearts to God's Holy Spirit and they lived it out as a faith in Jesus, as Jesus people. It's such folks who made First Baptist a gospel place in 1847. And if there's going to be a First Baptist in 2047, it will not be because we have cushy seats or polished pulpit voices or even an acclaimed architecture. There will be a First Baptist because there were saints in 2015 who were devoted to one another, who did not seek power, but honored others above themselves, who shared generously to meet needs, who practiced hospitality, who blessed their enemies, and above all lived out a radical Christ-like love with hearts flung wide 
and who could weep with others from a faith fully embraced by God's Spirit. Make note it will be because you and I share Jesus and live out Christ's love and make a difference in the lives of others. On All Saints Day, I have to ask myself, do I share my faith like those folks described in Romans and 1 John? More critical, what kind of faith will be held by others if I do not? Why be buried in this tiny, in the middle of nowhere, church cemetery? Why come here? Because of all the saints, those who shared the good news of Jesus through a radical love and they lived grace and mercy, who became a church of people who know when you're sick and they will come when you call, and they are here to dance and celebrate at the high points, and they will cry with you amid the hurts. They'll even come when the day our journey ends and they put you and I into God's eternal care. They will come because they care, and they care because they love Jesus. Oh, thanks be to God for them. And God, we pray, oh, make us like them. Amen.